Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third Goop Book Club event. I'm Elise, the Chief Content Officer of Goop, and thanks for tuning in. As you guys know, this is a live event, so I apologize in advance if there are any technical snafus or cameos from cats or kids like you. We're doing our best. Um, if there are any glitches, we'll be right back with you. So this is our third book. And if you've read all three, you may have noticed a thematic, and this was completely by coincidence, but they've all been written by debut authors, fresh new voices. And all of them happen to be incredibly wise. And this is certainly true of the author of Lot, Brian Washington. So I'm very excited to introduce and talk to Brian today. Brian is a National Book Award 535 honoree and a winner of the Dylan Thomas Prize and the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. He's been a finalist for many, many impressive prizes that we would all wish we could earn. Um, he lives in Houston, where this story collection is based. In fact, you could argue that Houston is one of the primary characters in all of the stories. Lot follows a boy, a son of a black mother and a Latino father who is trying to make, trying to make his way in a world um, that doesn't always see him for who he is. And he's trying to figure out who he is in this context. Um, so many critics put Lot on their best of the year list when the hardcover came out in 2019. We were thrilled we could convince Brian to come and talk to us about it today, even though it's 2020, because it's such a beautiful and prescient debut. And he's such an exciting new voice that we'll probably be turning to for decades, if I had to guess. So because this is live, we're hoping to take your questions. Please submit them in the chat question, sorry, the chat box, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. And at the end of the chat today, we'll also be announcing the next book club pick, which is kind of an exciting and titillating debut as well. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Brian Washington. Hello. Hey there, how's it going? Are you in Houston, sweltering? Hey, still, yeah, it's it's pretty gruesome outside right now. I can. It's hot in LA, so I can only imagine what it's, it's like the there. Worst. <laughs> it's the best and it's more. It's somewhere in between, yeah. How are you doing in the context of COVID and everything else that's happening in the world? Yeah, well, I mean, there's of course like an asterisk on the back of every time someone says that they're doing well or that they're doing good, you know, but like on the scope of things, like in my immediate vicinity, things have been pretty okay, all things considered. Yeah, on yourself? Same. It's like yeah. today, okay, you know? It's, yeah, yeah, it's, like today, and that's the most you can hope for. Like today is like quite all right, but like tomorrow is just like some new fresh yeah. hell. So we'll see. Exactly, um, and you are really in it too in the context of COVID down in Houston. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly accelerated in the past uh, few months, really, but the past few weeks, I suppose, as far as national visibility. Yeah, yeah, I know. We were supposed to be on the right side and doing well in LA, but we were the poster children of the appropriate response and look at us now, so. Yeah, yeah, but what, what can you do though? I mean, we can only do the best that we can, I suppose. Exactly, and there's so many unknown factors and there's a lot we'll learn in retrospect. So, all right, let's talk about the book, which is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I know you've been praised for like a year now, but it's really staggering. Um, so your characters have an incredible duality and um, they're complex. And, you know, I was just thinking about like Javi, for example, like you hate him and love him. And it's, is that difficult to sort of always create the humanity? Like, I feel like as a culture, we love binaries, mm -hmm. good and bad. Um, but that's not very accurate to life. So how do you sort of toe the line between heroes and bad guys? It's editing, I think, and just, <laughs> just going draft after draft, right? Because like any time that you're trying to write a narrative, at the end of the day, it's just like a series of words on the page, you know? And we're trying 
you know, if we're doing our jobs as opposed to create a world out of that or like an entire community of folks that have various loves and hates and things that they're striving towards and things that make them laugh and things that, you know, they're, they're struggling with. So it's tricky to create any character, I think, on the page, whether it's Javi, whether it's the, the mother, whether it's Nicholas, whether it's any of the characters in the stories. But I think that what part of what makes it really fun and insofar as it can be fun and or at least makes it something worth coming back to is like the challenge of creating an entire person that is so many different things at the same time. Um, you know, that is something I don't think you can really get tired of, or at least I haven't gotten sick of it yet, but it's certainly, you know, a challenge every time. What's the process? So I know like when you write a novel, you submit it or, or a series of stories, you submit it as intact, right? And so what then is the process of taking edits and evolving the characters from there? Because that lot, like every word counts. It is so uh, spare, you know, and but specific. So what does that look like? Like, did, you, did it change dramatically from what you submitted to what was published? That's a really good question. So it was kind of a circuitous process for the collection and that like when I started writing the stories that ultimately became Lot, I didn't think that it would be a book at the time. Like it was just a series of stories that I was writing mostly for my friends and then partly for various journals here and there. So I didn't have like a cumulative whole in mind. But once we sold the manuscript, like my agent and I, the job I suppose that my editor and I had from then was how do we take each of these autonomous stories and make them into one narrative that's cohesive yeah. and cumulative where every word counts and every thread counts. And that really, I don't know, speaks to like, just like how great of an editor that I have and how, you know, how great um, her eye is for what makes a, like the totality of, of a book. So a lot of it was, more so than you know building a building so to speak with each story after that it was a matter of uh, jenga i suppose like how do we pull the extraneous bits and what do we need to weave into the larger context mm -hmm. of the book so that each of these stories makes sense together and also apart yeah and you did such an incredible job and i feel like normally when there's that sort of um trick i don't even know if you call it trick but this idea of weaving disparate storylines together often and i understand the impulse but they're sort of a, like look how clever that was or like bet you didn't see that coming or um so i just want to commend you on the fact that it was done so elegantly and there wasn't any like it wasn't for revelation or effect it just felt like it in totality created kind of a portrait of a city almost first and foremost, and then mm -hmm. a community in a way that I thought was, like you could have been so back patty about it and it still would have mm -hmm. been great, but you weren't, which made it even better. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I have a great editor and that's a great agent who are very like yeah. instrumental as far as like steering, steering that course together. But... Uh -huh. um, okay, so, there's a lot of understated trauma in the book, right? The impact of class, race, sexuality, um, extreme poverty, homelessness, is like drug addiction, it's all there. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's also not the, the central theme of the book. So how did you do that without centering, without centering trauma? That's a really good question and I think that for me, it was just a matter of, again, like looking at each of the characters and like thinking of them as full human beings, right? Like I think that a trap that can be really easy to fall into when, you know, we're, we're crafting narratives, regardless of whether it's on the page or whether it's like a fiction podcast or we're thinking of like trying to come up with a pilot for something is to have like these archetypes, which inevitably become stereotypes if we lean too far into them by way of their having experienced a traumatic event or by way of being a marginalized entity or a double minority in, in you know, in an area where that's deeply frowned upon. And while 
someone's status as a marginalized person while the various traumas that a character may undergo over the course of a narrative or like before the narrative begins or even after it in some case or like are deeply characteristic to who we see them are on the page that's not the entirety of who they are right like the terrible thing happens to a character and they still have to live the rest of their life and they still have their hopes and their dreams and you know they still have their favorite foods they still have to walk the dog so to speak so I think the challenge on my end was negotiating the balance between description of who you know folks are on the page and the things that they've overcome and how those two ideas so to speak converge with one another and sometimes they coalesce and sometimes they don't but I don't think that either one of them or any particular fact uh should be defining for a character right like because you know we're trying to create people um, and people really aren't any one or two ways. Uh, people like are a lot of different things simultaneously, uh, and that you know that's tricky to get on the page sometimes. Yeah, and the reality is when you take any person and you dissect their life, everyone has some you know adverse, some aces, right? Some like a- adverse mm-hmm. childhood events that either become defining or not, or footnotes, or but yeah, I thought it was there were so many extreme moments that weren't asides like you gave them proper acknowledgement but it was just like whoa um like uh was he syrian whose whose father was an uncle were assassinated um Mm -hmm. yeah like for example that was just such a, a small beautiful portrait and that was enough like you just sort of dropped it there um Yeah. How did you research that? A lot of it, well, research, a lot of the, because the the entirety of the book, most of it is set in Houston and, you know, I'm based here, the overwhelming overwhelming majority of the the time, it was just a matter of being out in the world and spending time with folks and talking to folks. I do think that there's not really such a thing as like over research, right? Because even if you have a conversation between two supporting characters, let's say, and let's say that those characters come from two communities that you don't necessarily find yourself inundated with um, in contemporary American literature. Um, It can be really easy to sort of cast it off as they're just sort of being on the page for the sake of being on the page or on the page for just for the sake of like furthering a narrative. But what I have to do is think of, okay, who are these characters? What communities that they come from? What role does this community have at this certain geographic point that, you know, they originated in? How, how did they get to where they are? Um, What does their meeting at this particular point have to say about um, their particular stations in life? So in a lot of ways I end up over researching and overwriting, but all of that I think is necessary for me to get even the semblance of comfort with putting them on the page and then putting those pages out into the world because I feel like you have to know and you have to give dignity to the communities and characters that you're writing about because it's a show of respect Um, and it is a responsibility in a lot of ways especially if you're in a position where you're being given the sort of visibility um, that you know this book has ultimately gotten you want to do right by the folks that you're writing about and the folks that you're writing for yeah so how did you make the decision to not name for most of the book we don't know our narrator's name right it's like the final two pages i think that the grand reveal comes so why (laughs) i don't know that's a good question Uh, like so well i think that a a pivotal thing is that uh, a mentor of mine that i had named joanna leak um it was her idea to um give the name in the final story of the book she just read like a really early draft of it and she you know after we talked about it and like what we thought worked and what didn't work um she was just like hey you know this might be kind of wild but maybe you could just name nick at the end of the book and at first i was like "Ah, i don't know if i want to do all that but once i wrote a draft of it and sort of edited that draft and reworked the rest of that story and ultimately the rest of the stories toward that it felt as if though it couldn't have ended any other way so that just goes to show that you know oftentimes it's your friends that have the best uh best advice and the clearest uh, sort of vision toward what you yourself are trying to achieve. Um, But I was really, um, 
I feel like names are deeply important besides like the obvious sense of us knowing like who to call what, when, where, and why. But when you take away a name for a character, there's a shorthand that the reader doesn't have access to anymore, right? They may not necessarily know where this character is from. They may not necessarily have a sense of the time in which they grew up, if a name is like hyper regional or, um, you know, super common in, I don't know, the 80s and the 70s and not so like in the aughts and onwards. So taking away a name, I feel like forces readers and the audience to focus on the rest of the interactions that a character is having and the rest of their behavior on the page. And I think in a lot of ways it makes it more interactive between the author or the creator of a work and the reader and the audience as the both parties try to get a clear picture of like who these people are. Yeah. It's interesting too, because um, it's, it's so much more intimate. Like I to overshare, which is my favorite thing to do, but my husband and I were in a text fight and he kept calling me Elise in the text. And I was like, this is so weird. Like my, I'm not, we don't call each other by our names, you know, in our lives, we don't. And so in a weird way, every time he called me Elise, it took me out of the, it took me out of our text fight. I can't explain it that I don't know if there's anything there, but it feels like we don't yeah. really use each other's name. Yeah. It's and like, so, a, you know, it's like, it, it's just, it's a shorthand in a lot of ways. Right. And it's like, um, and then there's also the question of like using one name with, you know, one party or one community and using a completely different name with another party or another community. And, you know, the codes that we switch from community, to community or from person to person based on like our comfort with them or like our lack of comfort with them. And it can do a lot of work, I think, on the page, just not naming or giving different names or only responding to one name from one person as opposed to another person. Uh, like in the way that a character might just be mom to one character. And yet, you know, mom is actually um, Asia, for example, right, um, uh, with an entire life of her own and, uh, you know, dreams and hopes of her own. And it's, uh, I don't know, a lot, a lot can be in a name and a lot can be seen in the absence of a name as well. Yeah, no, totally. And so speaking of Nick, our narrator, you do a brilliant job of what we just watch him come of age from those first like fumblings on his neighbor's mattress to the way that he explores his sexuality and figures out what brings him pleasure. And obviously the way that he grapples with intimacy. I, I know you sort of leave it open as to whether he, he really can be intimate. Um, so how are you contemplating that? Mm, I think that for me, I wanted to avoid being overly prescriptive um, about that character's arc, whether it was the arc of Nick over his particular narrative, whether it was the arc of uh, Chris and Asia within their particular narrative, whether it was the arc of, uh, you know, the, just the two bros in Bayou and their particular narrative and uh, the ways in which they either come together or didn't, because I think that there's a way in which... Uh, Many queer narratives can lend themselves to ultimately being coming out narratives, and those those narratives are like deeply useful, but they aren't the only queer narrative, right? Like and in many senses, like as queer characters, they're constantly coming out, um, irrespective of their particular station in life, right? In the way that you have to decide how much of yourself you want to reveal to anybody that you're trying to build a relationship with or not build a relationship with, so. What I think I wanted to do was set all of the pieces on the page and all of the emotions and all of the sort of volleying um, between intimacy and not that Nick undergoes and just leave it to the reader um, to come to terms with it and to put an image on it and to put reins on it themselves. Because what really attracts me to narrative, I suppose, is that interplay between reader and writer and I think that makes it more interactive and I think that makes it more fun ultimately. Yeah. So there's a fair amount of infidelity in the book and you tell them sort of through other people and we learn about, you know, the father's affair through speculation in the neighborhood. And then that strange experience that Nick has at her house 
So why did you tell the stories that way? I think the for those particular stories and for any of the narratives where the story of somebody else was like a major factor in the way that infidelity could be, right? Or in the way that any rumor or any secret or piece of gossip could be, was really interesting to me is that I'm just interested in stories inside of stories, right? And not only like stories inside of stories, but the way in which the story that is told by one community and the way in which it's told by one community could sound wildly different to another community's ears. And just by way of their vantage point, um, you know, it just hits different. So I think that sort of pulling at the strands of like what a rumor is and what gossip is and what a story is within each of the stories was again like another challenge that like i'm just really grateful that i have the editor that i have in order to you know help me untangle it but that question is one that i kept coming back to and one that i wanted to keep circling around right like i wasn't really interested in answering the question so much as posing a bunch of different questions and then connecting those questions to other questions and giving all of those to the reader so that we could come up with something together so i know you're in houston and that it's your hometown and you love the city but like how did you tell that the, it's such a character was that intentional or just essential for, I mean, I'm sure anyone in Houston who reads it, I recognize some of it because I've been to Houston a little bit, but, oh, yeah. um, and Houston is so complex, right? In a state mm -hmm. that is, is perceived as not complex for whatever reason, or seem, it seems Texas is so specific and Houston is so everything. So how did you think yeah. about that? I mean, it's always been really fascinating to me, you know, in the same way that the South as a region is, to my understanding, the most diverse region in this country. Texas in itself is a world in and of itself, but within that world, like Houston is very much its own sort of tiny universe, partly because of, you know, the ethnic diversity, partly because of like the socioeconomic diversity and the diversity of lifestyles. And I think also the understanding from Houstonian to Houstonian. It's like kind of an implicit understanding that if you brought it up, uh, folks, you know, might call bullshit or whatever, but like you can exist and do many different things simultaneously, right? Like this understanding that like, if you're living in the city, you can be a handful of things at the same time. Um, so that was something that I wanted to hopefully carry through the narrative um, as just Houston as a character. But also I think that the idea of like a city being deeply singular to one character and being an entirely different way for another character whilst being integral to them as well is something that's really attractive to me, right? And the ways in which people become who they are in the same place, but their experiences of that place can be wildly different from one another just by merit of uh, their vantage point and their experiences within that place. So city was very much a character or the attempt was to have it be a character, but also a character that had multitudes within it and a character that was different depending on whose narrative we were following. So ideally a city for Nick was very different from a city for Javi, which is very different from a city from Jan, which is very different from the city for any number of the characters. And yet it's all Houston at the same time. So anytime I have a, a work that's set in a particular place, that place is pretty pivotal as far as like my understanding of like where's the story going where was it originally and where is the reader now and like where's the audience now like what are we trying to do with this brief point in time yeah no that makes so much sense all right let's do a couple of audience questions um so how did you get into writing and did you write as a child or as a teen yeah i actually was not the most arduous reader to say the least when i was growing up i mean I, my usual thing to say is that like if there's someone in your life who doesn't read i read significantly less than that person until my late <laughs> teen i think like as far as like narrative is concerned what really got me was watching film right and particularly watching uh foreign film which is or you know films that uh, that weren't american or contemporary american films and just like watching loads and loads and loads of films whether they were like from ozu whether they were edward yang whether they were i don't know like the early new way french films like this that really excited me 
I suppose, so that when I did sort of get the reading bug, I suppose, like in my late teens, early 20s, um, what I immediately gravitated to or t toward was literature and translation, which I think was pivotal as far as like my understanding of like what a story could be on the page. Uh, so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't the biggest reader at all. And I wasn't the biggest writer in a lot of ways, but it was through like the encouragement of friends. It was through the encouragement of uh, various mentors that I had the chance to work with that I was able to sort of stumble into a routine. And it's really helpful to hear that, hey, like, you know, the thing that you're doing is interesting to me or the thing that you're doing yeah. um, could live a life outside of itself, right? Like, not necessarily saying that, like, you'll be able to monetize it or whatever, but that, like, hey, this is, like, an interesting thing, and I just kept doing it because I liked that other folks were into it as well. I love that that answer, too. I mean, as a child, I was a, I grew up in Montana, which is similarly perceived to be sort of one thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. like Texas in that way, those huge states with people who like horses um but <laughs> i was a voracious reader and so people and, and primarily of novels and people are always asking me if i'm going to write a novel and i'm like i could never write a novel it's just you have it or you don't in a weird way and so i don't think that the two are always related you know no. No. um this question I have the same question, so thank you for asking it. So many of the smaller characters in Lot are so complex and rich. Do you see yourself returning to any in future books? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, only because I really, I, I kind of have like a roundabout way of how I start a project and how I end up finishing a project, right? Like for Lot, it was a bit less roundabout in that it was, you know, a bunch of stories and at some point I looked down and I had enough pages for a book, right? So that was pretty cut and dry. But for, uh, like, for Memorial, for example, like the next book I'm writing, like it started as a short story um, that was for a zine that a friend had asked me to write for. And in the middle of writing another thing, like a novel that I suppose I thought I was supposed to be writing at any given point in time, I kept going back to that short story because it was more fun and it interested me more interested me more and most people probably will have immediately taken that as like a cue like yeah, this is probably the fucking thing that you should be working on but for me it took you know a, a bit longer so i i kind of have like a circuitous way of coming back to like what ultimately like works for a project for me but at the same time like the i feel like sometimes i spend at least as much time on those supporting characters and those smaller sort of supposedly my new characters than I do or as I do on like the protagonists themselves because they're part of the world and you know your protagonists are still navigating the world and they're pivotal with any other portion of the world you're trying to build. Okay so you brought up Memorial which comes out at the end of October. I'm assuming yeah. we can all pre-order it now. Um, so it also takes place in Houston and you've described it as a multi-culty gay slacker tromedy. So can you tell us a little bit about the book and yeah. what was it, what inspired it? Because you, Lot came to you when you saw two guys flirting at a register, right? In a taco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was at uh, I was at Brothers Tacos um, in, in uh, downtown Houston. I saw two guys floating at the register, and I thought, "Whoa, that's wild!" And you know, then a lot happened. But for a Memorial, it was uh, it it was a bit more less more and less organic for Memorial, in that like I had a question, I suppose, and that question was, "Does what what is a relationship?" or what does a relationship look like when it is the most formative relationship that a couple may have or that a group of folks may have, but it isn't necessarily the end game relationship. And what does that look like on the page? And not only what does that relationship look like, but what do like the creases within that relationship, mm -hmm. as, you know, the participants realize that maybe this isn't working and they try to make it work and they come to terms with what that looks like or doesn't look like. Um, I didn't see that with the, you know, the queer communities of color that I wanted to see it with on the page done in this very specific way in a narrative that is set in both Houston and in Osaka as the book is set, which is like deeply specific. So, you know, the question became like, is one, like, is this something that, 
you know, could hold for a novel and eventually had enough pages for it to be a novel. And the next question was like, how and can like I make it good, right? Or can I even do it? Um, a, a funny thing about Memorial is that like, I was really fortunate to have friends who told me pretty early on that the experience of writing a novel would be not radically different from writing, you know, your, your story collection, but they one doesn't necessarily belie the other. So I didn't um, start Memorial thinking that, you know, I've already written this first book, first book, you know, like I'm like good to go. It's going to be so fucking easy, that sort of thing. But I was prepared I think, for the challenge of working on a sustained narrative, but I could not have written it if I had not sort of spent time with like my strengths and weaknesses that surfaced while writing and then editing a lot and in a lot of ways writing towards those strengths and also writing towards those weaknesses and seeing like what I could get better at and you know the things that I wasn't so strong at how can I extrapolate the corners of them in order for them to work on the page. Is Lot gonna be a TV show or like is, it seems like you would be is it? Yes Lot is going to be a TV show I can say that yes. Oh my god, amazing. Congrats. Yeah, 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 yeah thank Yay. you. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about it. That's exciting. So are you gonna write are you gonna be in the writing writer's room? I'm assuming. Or do you mm, let for it a lot go? Of, well, it's I'm like somewhere in the middle, you know, for a lot specifically. Yeah. It's a narrative that I'm just excited to see where it goes. So like I'll be in the room, right? And I'll be like watching so to speak but like i won't you know, it, you know I'm yeah i'm like working with a team that is like really good at what they do and you know i'm just really looking forward to seeing what they come up with but at the same time i'm not someone who uh if i didn't think it could be done then i wouldn't have like agreed to it so i'm just like super excited to see how it's developed and super excited to see like where it develops and you know where it'll go from here yeah, I mean, based on what you cited as inspiration, it seems like writing TV or movies seems like something, if you're going to do short stories and novels, may as well write a screenplay too. Yeah, there's like a, <laughs> I don't know what right now, it's, just, it's like a question mark. There. It's just like, you know, yeah, just a question mark, a question mark. But you know, it's, it's a, they're all just different forms, you know, like we're trying to create worlds and relationships and people. Um, regardless of whether that's on the page or on the screen. And it's all difficult, but they all have, you know, their benefits. And you know, I don't know, like these sort of limited series that we're seeing, like eight, nine hours, those are some of the best storytelling that we're seeing today. So it's really, you know, any time that you get the chance to work on the thing that you enjoy, that other people are also into, I think that's like really rare and like a really big gift. Yeah. All right. Here's another audience question. Is empathy one of your strengths as a writer? Is that how you develop characters and decide how much of the characters to leave for readers to interpret? Mm, that's a really good question. I don't know if it would be okay for me, myself, to say that empathy is my strength, right? I feel like that might <laughs> make me at all this summer. But I think that it's something that I strive toward for sure, right? And like, and then the natural question is like, how do you strive toward it if you can't say that you do it? I think that when we take our characters and when we treat them with dignity and we treat their communities with respect and we treat the communities that we're writing about with the intent of not stereotyping them and not casting them as archetypes and not having them in the story for the sake of having them in the story, but for, I don't know, just like showing the world that we're trying to portray within any given text or any given project, I don't think that you can go wrong there, right? And I think that mm -hmm. that in itself is like a leap of faith in a lot of ways because you're trusting a reader to see your intent on one end, but on the other, the reader is trusting you to show them these communities and these folks and, you know, they're trusting you as the author or the creator of whatever your thing is to, you know, guide them through the story and, and, and that trust goes both ways. So I think that you have to be deeply conscious of that if you're looking to tell stories that have fully fleshed characters and have fully rounded out worlds, which is ultimately the goal. Yeah. All right. I know we're almost out of time, but I have to ask, so what are you watching and reading now? So what am I watching right now? Um, Raven Leilani's Luster comes out tomorrow. So you can- Oh, interesting. You have 
Yeah, you have like fucking five hours to. Oh, yeah. you you have like <laughs> you have five and a half hours to pre-order it, or you can go to the store and go to your yeah, or yeah, you can order it on the Goop link. Hopefully, like immediately after this. Um, yeah, Raven Milani's up there. Um, you made ease, uh, Tokyo Ueno Station, um, which is which is a really great book that was released um, in I think in June. I want to say in the states, and it had been released a little while prior. Um, Samantha Irby's um, latest essay collection. Uh, Britt Bennett's uh, the vanishing half um a lot of really exciting stuff going on um as far as like watching stuff um it's old like it's been out but i'm gonna plug it because it's a beautiful movie there's a movie called yee by edward yang that i rewatch mm-hmm. uh once like every two months or so and i feel like late summer is like a really good time to watch it so if you're don't have anything to do this evening you should queue up ye on with uh, your criterion app um but you know just like a lot of stuff that's really exciting in fiction right now and um, i feel like we're despite the world seemingly um you know, there's just so much to look forward to yeah well creativity comes out of chaos right and no. so i think this big pause i think we're gonna see amazing work emerge um, and certainly people are reading, which is great. Yeah, so, yeah, folks are reading. Yeah, which is always exciting to see. Well, that was sort of the perfect baton toss. And I'm because I'm going to tell you about our next book club pick, um, which is Raven Leilani. So, Brian, thank you so, so much for joining us and for your book. And thank you so much for having me. For Memorial, everyone pre order it now. Um, and stay, don't overheat in Houston. Yeah, likewise. And everybody stay safe. Yeah, like everybody. I know. Wear yeah. a mask. Please wear a mask. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Please. All right. Well, have a great night. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I promise we didn't plan that. But yes, the next book club book is Raven Leilani's Luster, which is out tomorrow. You can pre-order it now or order it tomorrow. Um, if you go to our, our it's, let me make sure I get the URL right, join our Facebook group. Um, and then also you can go to goop.com slash goop book club for reading guides, the books and all of that. Um, so Luster by Raven Leilani is, let's just say it's spicy and there's a lot of sex guys. It's a different, different, it's beautifully written and stunning as everything that we've done, but it's a little bit more salacious, which I think we all need in August after four months of COVID. Um, It's definitely the most, as we're calling it, fiery read so far. So Luster is a story of an affair between Edie, a young woman slogging through her publishing job in New York City, and Eric, who is 23 years her senior and is in an open marriage. Polyamory, people. Um, It's also the story of Edie's relationship with Eric's wife. So it's about trying to be an artist, trying to get by, trying to grieve, trying to find pleasure, trying to love and be loved. Um, I think it's, this is to quote Kiki on our team, but it is, one of the books that will define what it's like to be young in this moment. So pick up a copy and join us and um, let us know what you think. Again, Facebook group or go to the website or you can find us on Instagram. Thanks again for tuning in and thank you to Brian and pre-order Memorial as well.